Hello and welcome to the Beyond Biotech podcast number 15. This podcast is sponsored by Single-Use Support, the end-to-end process solution provider for fluid management. Single-Use Support innovates solutions around single-use technologies, including freeze-thaw, fill drain, cold storage, and shipping of products in single-use systems. Its Ross shell protects any type and size of single-use bags, enabling customers to produce life-saving drugs more safely and economically. I'm Jim Connell from LaBiotech and this episode of the podcast is coming out on the 23rd of September, which is International Sign Language Day and Redhead Appreciation Day. I have a redhead too if I'm out in the sun without a hat. This was one of those weeks, and I'm sure you've had them too, where that to-do list ended up being a didn't list. Mine was a bit longer than usual because this weekend I'm headed to Sweden for NLS days and that means having to try and at least get some of next week's podcast ready in advance, as well as planning for our first special newsletter related to how biotech is helping tackle food loss and waste as the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste is September the 29th. This podcast also has something of a theme as well as tomorrow is World Cancer Research Day. And this year's theme is support research to prevent cancer and catch it early. And so a couple of the interviews this week reflect that theme. So this week's podcast has three guests. In honor of World Cancer Research Day, we have an overview of cancer research with Nadim Ahmed, CEO of Colonin Oncology, and a chat with Evo Timmermans, CEO of Pleco Therapeutics. And we also have a conversation with Anders Christensen, CEO of Ticomed. And we also have our weekly chat with global commercial real estate services company JLL with Travis McReady. I guess that means it's time for our weekly look at all of the news you may have missed over at labiotech.eu over the past seven days, or at least some of the ones that I can pronounce. Bugworks Research and Cytocare Cancer Hospitals are setting up a cancer research centre. Cell Research Corporation announced positive results of its Phase 1 diabetic foot ulcer study, and the FDA approved Heron Therapeutics post-op nausea and vomiting drug. Genfit is acquiring Versantis to expand its liver disease portfolio. Tokyo scientists revealed a possible new direction for getting rid of cancer cells, and a global consortium is hoping to develop breakthrough RNA-based anti-cancer immunotherapy. Kamari Pharma raised $8 million for the development of drugs for skin diseases. Foodative is creating bee-free honey using precision fermentation biotech. And CGT Catapult started VR training to help ensure future workforce needs. Genscript and Avectus want to improve non-viral cell therapy manufacturing. There were positive results from Aracor Therapeutics' clinical trial of rapid concentrated insulin, and Cytoreason and Pfizer agreed a deal worth up to $110 million for AI drug discovery and development. There are looming challenges for Europe's cell and gene therapy space. 1023 Health completed the superstructure of a new sterile production facility in Switzerland and a new bio-studio program collaboration aims to create life science startups. The Novo Nordisk Foundation is investing $200 million for the first quantum computer for life sciences research. The FDA cleared the Selenkos ALS drug for trial and Quinton Health closed a financing round to advanced disease modeling platforms. We had an article on the five hottest biotech companies in Israel. A new study shows how prostate cancer may start and there was more good news when a promising MND drug was shown to slow disease progression. More big news as Swiss scientists reduced the resistance of dormant melanoma cells. In the US, the National Haemophilia Foundation launched a research fund and Cartography Biosciences unearthed cancer immunotherapy targets. Researchers identified a new treatment target for central nervous system injury and neurological disease. Study data for a glioblastoma treatment confirmed its safety and tolerability profile. And you can read all of these and a whole lot more at labiotech.eu. 
So let's get things underway, and for us this week we're talking about recent research showing that Ticomed's ILB has the potential to treat neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS. So to tell us about it and the company is Ticomed's CEO, Anders Christensen. I mean, Ticomed is a privately held company by a pharmaceutical company that was founded back in 2002, located in the south of Sweden, uh, and our focus is harnessing and the medical potential of the abilities, uh, body's ability to self-repair, to re- regenerate. And that's really linked to the discovery that I can talk a little bit about later on. The company has a very clear vision that we want to deliver affordable uh, and effective therapies to improve human health across the globe. So a very broad one, but we do believe with our unique mechanism of action that we can target that. And so what conditions are you working on? Currently, we're working on ALS. Uh, that's our lead program. Uh, we're also working on TBI, traumatic brain injury, and we have a program up and running in islet cell transplantation. And so could you tell me a little bit about ILB and what it is and how it works? So uh, ILB is a low molecular weight dextran sulfate. What ILB does it is that it unlocks the body's own repair signals in uh, disease and damaged tissue. And uh, the uniqueness with this uh, yeah, mechanism of action is that it mobilizes and mo- modulates natural occurring tissue repair mechanism. And it does that to restore cellular homeostasis and function. So instead, for example, of artificial modulating individual cell response like most other drugs or gene therapies, ILB switches on uh, the body's own repair system that reprograms the whole cell response. So that's that's the uniqueness of the drug and, and the mechanism of action. And that's why we believe that this has the potential to become the next generation of regenerative medicine. I wonder if you could go into a little bit of detail about the research that was published recently in Frontiers in Pharmacology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a, really a summary of a lot of extensive work that has happened during the past couple of years with regards to understanding the mechanism of action as such. So this conclude. Uh, both preclinical work, our gene array biomap, and then linking it to the late uh, last or our first clinical study in in ALS at Solgensk University Hospital. And the publication describes very well how the molecule ILB unlocks the body's own repair signals and indices and damaged tissue. And we can then demonstrate that in various models such as as TBI and link it into into our first safety study in, in ALS. With ILB, what are the implications for those with neurodegenerative diseases in terms of what they can hopefully expect in the future? These diseases, I mean, all are, I mean, there's a huge unmet need. And we believe that ILB as a drug candidate with this you know, unique mechanism of action that actually builds on the body's own ability to self repair and to regenerate can really be a strong addition to, to what's uh, currently being developed today. So we believe that we have an opportunity both in chronic and acute conditions with this uh, drug candidate. Where do you go from here in, in terms of timelines? Obviously, you can't be exact, but... No, absolutely. But uh, right now we are preparing for uh, next stage development and really focusing on our lead program, ALS, where where we had some very strong data from our first clinical study. So we can see that ILB has been a safe and and well-tolerable drug candidate. But also we have some very encouraging uh, functional data looking at ALS functional rating scale. So with those data and results, we are embarking for a next stage development and are currently pre- preparing for a, a new study. We are, of course, talking both to investors and to uh, pharma companies in able to bring the project forward. So very busy then with all the things that you're working on. Yes, there's busy times, but very exciting times. And we believe that ILB has a, a role to play. And our mission is really to make sure that we get to the next level and hopefully eventually being able to provide this to patients in need. Now we move into the field of oncology as tomorrow is World Cancer Research Day. It's now in its seventh year and it's a global movement to raise awareness of the importance of cancer research to increase survival, give access to scientific advances worldwide and to reduce the global burden of cancer. One company in the news recently was Pleco Therapeutics, a biopharma company in the Netherlands developing novel treatments designed to detoxify the cancer microenvironment. It has raised $17.2 million in Series A financing, and to tell us what that means and about the company is its CEO, Evo Timmermans. 
Yeah, Plico Therapeutics uh, is a young company. Actually, we just celebrated our fourth anniversary. And it started by, uh, I would say, by serendipity. A while ago, I met an oncologist in the US, and she works for one of the largest leukemic centers in the world, which is MD Anderson Center in Houston. And she introduced me to the concept of metals playing an important role in disease and in disease progression. And at that time, and I'm talking now six years ago, she wanted to speak to me because I was working for a company that had a number of compounds that she thought were good candidates to explore uh, what she was seeing and, and see whether she could intervene in, in treatment of her patients. At the time when I worked for the company, it was not a research company, but when I left later, I contacted her again and we started talking about it. And uh, it happened so that MD Anderson, as an academic institution, needed an external partner to carry that uh, concept and develop it further. And I suggested we set up a company in the Netherlands to that end. So we decided to work together. I contacted some of my old colleagues who I worked with in the past, who I knew had certain expertise. So assembled a, a team and we started with four founders over four years ago. We got now a headquarters in uh, in the Netherlands, in a city called Nijmegen, the east part of the city. But one of our collaborators works in Israel, also does some work on research laboratory there. And we've got recently, we employed two staff members. One is in the, based in the UK and another one in the US. Before we get on to your lead candidate, I wonder if you could run through some of the challenges when it comes to tackling AML. Yes, there are quite, quite a few challenges when you look at AML. In the last decades, we've seen many improvements in the treatments, but, but AML is uh, only modest uh, when, when it comes to uh, showing success. AML, perhaps just a brief mentioning what AML is, it is actually a blood cancer. So in the maturing cells, in the bone marrow, the cells uh, keep on proliferating, so keep on dividing, but they don't mature enough. So what they do, they fill up the bone marrow. You you cannot get enough uh, white or red blood cells. And that leaves us, if if it's untreated, patients would die within a matter of weeks or months. These leukemic cells, they start to spread throughout the body. They accumulate in the liver and spleen and uh, in the lungs. And it's, it's not a solid tumor in the sense that other tumors have a specific location and you can treat them. So the first challenge is that uh, how, how do you get rid of these leukemic cells? That is obviously by chemotherapy, that is the indicated treatment. But another challenge is that all these cells, they divide in various ways and you get a lot of variants. So if you look at the cytogenetic profile, you see a lot of diversity and mutations in cells. And that that means that for each individual patient, you need to have a profile and see what what the treatment uh, would suit best. And and that is... uh, clinically quite challenging because it changes also continuously. Now, if you look at the primary options, that is uh, chemotherapy, then you see that um, typically an AML patient, AML is a disease of all ages, but typically a patient is over 60 years of age. So most of the first diagnoses are made between 60 and 65 years of age. And these are people who, if, if we get older, who treat chemotherapy worse and also are more resistant to chemotherapy and also um, also have a higher likelihood that they will get a relapse and that disease will return after the chemo wipes out the leukemic cells. Also, if you're older, you're not eligible uh, for, for uh, stem cell transplantation. That is more for the, for the younger part of the population. So in the, in the sense of finding an uh, adequate treatment that is not toxic and that is yeah, well tolerated by the patients you want to treat, uh, that, that is a big challenge. So I guess if we move on to PTX061, or if you could tell me what that is and how it works and what it does. The investigator, as she introduced me to the concept, showed clearly that metals play a role in progression of disease. And it means that if you look at the, uh, for instance, the blood concentration of uh, patients with AML, that they have a higher concentration of toxic metals in their blood than non-AML patients. So she was interested in a class of compounds, in a group of compounds that we we call generally chelating agents. And she wanted to use some of those compounds to extract extract metals uh, from, for instance, the bone marrow of uh, and the plasma of the patients. Now, there are agents on the market used for acute intoxication. They're very uh, crude. Uh, 
and, and have a very uh, strong side effect profile as well. But these are the category of patients that we were looking at. And our goal is to fine tune those patients and add ingredients in to make it more efficient. Now, if you, if you look at chelating agents and you look at, for instance, Wikipedia, you get over 200 of these agents. And we screened a lot of those agents and looked for agents that are not even currently in use in, in the clinic. We looked for agents that had the best profile. So in other words, could, could take out the toxic metals that we want to. And I'm thinking now, lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, those are toxic metals. But, but also, on the other hand, spare essential metals. Our lead compound, ptx 61 is one of those agents. And we combine that with a number of ingredients in its formulation and also with an antioxidant to promote the release of metals from the cell. So that is sort of optimized uh, formulation. And what... What it does is actually the chelating agents bind the metals and they form com complexes that are just excreted from the body. And the antioxidant mitigates the uh, damaging effect of metals, so it reduces the, the oxygen stress. So PTX061 is the name of our lead compound. And so could you tell me what your plecoid therapies are and the relevance of toxic metals in the cell? First, to mention that plecoids and the name of the company and also of these metals are named after uh, an aquarium fish, which is called plecostomus. That is a uh, suckermouth catfish in uh, English, and it is a fish that eats the algae from the inside of the glass of the aquarium and from the stone. So it, it cleans up the aquarium from the inside. And that is also uh, the analogy with our compounds. So we want to clean up the um, cellular microenvironments where the stem cells grow, where they multiply and remove toxic metals from, uh, from that environment to have a more healthier production of uh, new cells. The relevance of metals in cells is actually something that is not well understood because typically people always consider metals as essential uh, elements for uh, body processes and, and for uh, catalyzing certain biochemical processes. But there are some uh, metals in the environment that are clearly not uh, supposed to be there and i'm just talking about mercury or lead. these are elements that are the results of the environment we live in and particularly after after the onset of the industrial revolution we saw that a number of diseases surfaced which did not surface before we start to realize more and more that the accumulation of metals in the body is a very important aspect uh, when you look at diseases Metals, they enter the body and they always find a place to, um, yeah, to connect. They connect to biomolecules, uh, for instance, to DNA. They connect, they make it more difficult to read, to multiply. But also they have some favorable places, uh, like bone marrow is one of them, but also nerve cells. N metals like to accumulate in nerve cells. If you look at, for instance, a disease like Parkinson, which is a neurodegenerative disease, that was only first described around 1830. And that was 50 years after the Industrial Revolution started. So, so there is obviously a relationship in time with the accumulation and the exposure to metals and some diseases that we see. And over time, over a lifespan, people accumulate metals in their body. And um, we see now also that men live uh, twice as long as they did 200 years ago. So we got more time to accumulate those metals. And those metals don't disappear by themselves. The half-life time of lead to uh, exit the body is about 30 years. So there is much more metal content in a human being than there was ever before in history. And, and, and we've always known that acute exposure to metals, that, they, uh, that that causes diseases. We got the professional diseases due to uh, intoxication of, of one or more metals. But the chronic exposure is uh, much less uh, recognized. And, and metals are an everyday products. If you eat crabfish, they got methyl mercury. Batteries contain cadmium. If you walk on the street, you inhale lead. There are many examples of people living close to highways where they have a higher incidence of, you know, of certain types of cancer. So we are learning more and more as we go along about the role of metals in, in the body and their interference with uh, normal regular processes. And then that is also a bit what our therapy is looking at, looking at indications, looking at diseases, and particularly in oncology, where there's a clear relationship between the presence of metals and the progression of disease. 
and and that is actually a first in class approach because because there's not there are not uh, other um, agents that target to do that. Most agents in cancer look at certain receptors, at certain mechanisms, at uh, attacking the vasculature of the tumor to make it grow less efficient. So and and what we are doing, we target the underlying causes, or one of the underlying causes of cancer, which means the presence of metals in microcellular tissue and, and therefore the perpetuation of cancer. So in that sense, we have a novel approach. And the uh, investigator in Houston has already indicated when she looked at her patients that there's a strong relationship between the presence of metals and disease and also the magnitude of metal exposure and the, and the long-term prognosis. So the higher the concentration of metals she found in uh, the plasma of patients, the poorer their long-term prognosis. So, so there's actually quite some evidence emerging that this is a very important factor, that metals play an important role in, in disease. To give you one more example, if we look at uh, bone marrow content of lead nowadays, and we compare that to prehistoric men, because you can measure that, met metal doesn't decay, bone marrow is there to, to be researched, and we see that nowadays there's 100 uh, times more lead concentration in the bone marrow compared to prehistoric men. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that this causes diseases when the body cannot compensate for that anymore. You just recently opened in the US as well. Why did you do that? Yeah, we recently opened uh, an office in the US. We got uh, one new staff member who lives in uh, New Jersey. He operates from that. And uh, to us as a company, it's important to get a product to the market. And there are major markets in the world. We are a European company, but obviously the US market is of uh, major importance. And our interaction with the FDA it also uh, allows us more easy to, to apply for research grants in the US. So as a company grow, then it, it makes perfect sense to have an office there. Speaking of financing, you just got some new funding recently. What does that allow you to do? As you mentioned, Jim, we recently uh, had some funding. We just closed the Serie A investment round and raised uh, 17.3 million euros. And with that money, we uh, for the next few years, we can complete the research that is needed to bring our lead compound to a dossier submission. So, so it will allow us to complete all the studies and, and tie the results together in a regulatory dossier and submit that to the FDA and, uh, and the European agency. And it also allows us to progress in other indications uh, next to acute myeloid leukemia. As the first indication, we also have a second indication. We're looking at small cell lung cancer, which is, is an aggressive type of lung cancer associated with smoking. And we also uh, are doing some preclinical work there and it allows us to progress to the clinical stage uh, with this funding. Perhaps I could mention that the funding was achieved. We have a collaboration with a company in Belgium called Hyloris Pharmaceuticals. They invested about half of the money I mentioned just now, and for the rest it was uh, funding that was uh, achieved by investment of a number of angel investors in the Netherlands and in, the, and, and in Belgium. And we also have... Uh, a contribution from a regional development company in the Netherlands. And the Dutch ministry added 5 million euros for investment uh, as in a program called the Innovation Credit. So, so we got uh, yeah, the money that secures the activities for the next few years. And we did that without, without venture capital money, uh, which is also quite uh, remarkable. So where, where are you at on that journey now with PTX 061? Well, at the moment, we're looking at the formulation. So at, uh, completing the, the formulation me means adding all the components and uh, put, putting the product together. And it will then be uh, put, put in a production. We are producing a small clinical batch. And with, we want to test it uh, early next year in, uh, in the first group of patients. We, we think that development can be speed up uh, considerably because it is, uh, the first indication is an orphan indication. So it means we've got, uh, yeah, we, we've got quite a fast development, some support from regulators. And um, we, we expect over the next few years that, yeah, development will, will progress uh, rapidly. Well, this is, obviously, there's a lot with PTX 061, but is there anything else in the pipeline? 
Yeah, we, we are screening. Preclinically, we've screened six compounds, and we think three of them are candidate products for uh, testing in the clinic. Uh, we're progressing now the first one. We're looking at new possibilities, so looking at analogs, looking at uh, similar compounds as, as the ones we're looking at, perhaps with improved properties. And we're also looking at other indications. So we have contact with some academic centers that we work with and look at, uh, apart from uh, AML and small cell lung cancer, look at other cancers and see, see whether we can obtain uh, some information on the metal accumulation in patients. So we're looking both in terms of indications and in terms of compounds, we're looking at uh, expansion over the next uh, few years. Now, because it's World Cancer Research Day tomorrow, we thought we'd have an overview of the field right now. And to do that for us is Nadim Ahmed, CEO of Cullinan Oncology. Cullinan Oncology is a biopharmaceutical company dedicated to creating new standards of care for patients with cancer. Okay, so I guess to get started, I wonder if you could brief me on World Cancer Research Day and what the relevance is. Because if you look online, there's a day for pretty much everything. The World Cancer Research Day is on Saturday, September 24th, and it really aims to draw attention to the burden of cancer and promote research surrounding both the disease and new treatments. This year's theme, interestingly, is cancer research works driving progress together. So collaboration is going to be a very important theme. And unfortunately, and sadly, by 2040, the number of new cancer cases per year worldwide is expected to rise to 29.5 million people and the number of cancer-related deaths to 16.4 million people. So World Cancer Research Day was originally designed to contribute to the objectives of the World Cancer Declaration to promote cancer research and to keep the momentum going. And its aim is really to accomplish the scientific advances that will lead towards achieving the goal that brings us together, namely to defeat cancer. The organizers behind World Cancer Research Day are encouraging everyone to help raise awareness by using the social media hashtag World Cancer Research Day. Sobering when you mention some of those numbers, you mentioned 30 million. I mean, that's like the population of Canada. You talk about the COVID pandemic, but then, uh, you know, here we are and we, we kind of managed to push to solve COVID and yet cancer is one of the biggest killers globally. I mean, why Why do you think it is that we're still struggling with that? Yeah, I mean, of course, COVID was a global acute issue that needed dealing with immediately. Ironically, and unfortunately, one of the negative impacts of things like lockdowns related to COVID on cancer patients were that they were missing their follow-up appointments while their cancer could have been progressing. So that was one negative impact. Also, diagnoses were likely impacted due to patients not presenting to clinics and hospitals, resulting in delaying the diagnoses of new cancers as well. The other thing, of course, is, you know, as modern medicine improves, people are living longer. And the longer you live, the higher chance of you actually getting cancer, ironically. Same with heart disease, too. And I think the other thing is one of the biggest issues that's poorly understood often around cancer is it's not just one disease. I mean, cancer or the broad term of cancer really encompasses a heterogeneous group of over 200 different complex diseases, all requiring different treatments, all with different outcomes, all with a different biologic and genetic basis. So people often think of cancer as one homogeneous disease and think one treatment can solve the, the cancer issue. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. So for example, the treatment for lung cancer is very different to the treatment of breast cancer. However, on the bright side, when you do look at cancer research over the last few years, the field has made tremendous progress. And I personally believe that the future and the promise of science has never been brighter. Just a few years ago, actually in 2018, Dr. Jim Allison and Dr. Tasuku Honya were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for accelerating the field of immuno-oncology based on their seminal work in the area. And then from that research, we've seen important new treatments available now for patients. And on a personal level, I was very closely involved with the development of the IMID class of drugs that have been game changers for the hematologic malignancies, especially multiple myeloma. And so overall, you know, we are constantly learning more about the biologic basis of cancer. And I think that understanding has really yielded important developments now 
and I believe will continue in the future as well. It's very difficult to quantify, but do you think that on a year-by-year basis we're further ahead than we were one, two years ago? Yeah, so I think since we started the theme on COVID, one of the other impacts of COVID was that clinical trials were negatively impacted. As many hospitals and clinical trial sites were really focusing on getting COVID under control. So that was another consequence of the of the COVID impact. Fortunately, though, clinical trial sites are now back up and running and recruitment of patients into clinical trials is coming back to normal levels. And then I do think we are making progress. So if you look at the last year, the FDA approved over 45 new cancer drugs or new indications despite the impact of COVID. So that's been really encouraging. And I also think it's important to remember that, you know, just one treatment in a small indication can make a huge difference at the individual patient level. And yeah, I was very fortunate to meet a patient recently who was enrolled in one of our clinical trials. And he shared his experience in the trial and what it's meant to him. And even more importantly, and we underestimate the impact on families, the impact on his family, and as well as the milestones that he's now able to achieve, which he thought would be impossible when he was first thought of his cancer diagnosis. So for this individual patient, we're absolutely further ahead than this time last year. And that's what we stay focused on at Cullinan Oncology. Our mission is to create new standards of care for patients, not just incrementally improve their treatment experience. I guess with everything like this, you want it to be over yesterday. It must be for you a little frustrating, I guess, because you we're dealing with trials with results in 2024 and 2025. And so it, everything seems very much into the future when it comes to being able to make a difference now. Is that frustrating? One thing I always talk to my team about, including my leadership team, is speed of execution and What I mean by that is that, you know, patients are always waiting for what we produce. Um, And so I think for cancer specifically, you know, we do have some opportunities to bring important new treatments to patients quicker. For example, the opportunity for accelerated approval, at least in the US, where you can bring new treatments that are addressing serious diseases like cancer by using you know things like surrogate endpoints with single arm studies like response rates etc so i do think that is important for cancer patients but for me personally you know it's never quick enough because i know at the end of the day somebody's life is going to be significantly impacted so we really focus on speed of execution and how can we advance our programs as quickly as possible with cancer treatments it's not just biotech there's all kinds of other sectors working in this can you give me a kind of an idea as to how much of the research is in the biotech sector and what biotech has to offer with cancer research a very significant portion actually of cancer research probably over 70 percent actually takes place in the biotech sector you know in addition to the work obviously that's being conducted in academic labs and in the large pharma companies I would say biotech continues to remain at the forefront of advances in cancer research. And in fact, many of the promising treatments that have been approved to date have always or originally originated in the biotech sector. The other thing I think that is really important to advance continued progress is collaboration, shared learning. And in fact, President Biden referred to that in his recent moonshot speech as well. And so at Cullin Oncology, it's really core to how we operate We describe it as innovating without borders, which means we believe that external collaboration is just as important to advance new treatments and drive innovation versus what we discover within our four walls. And so our deep relationships with academic partners, health system partners, really work together to combine collective knowledge, expertise and resources so that we can all work towards our common goal of transforming patient outcomes. We also expand our reach and capabilities through strategic industry partnerships. So while the biotech sector has and continues to have a lot to offer in the area of cancer research, the work we do together with academia, industry and regulatory authorities actually is also very important to really create this ecosystem of innovation. Could you maybe highlight some of the biotech approaches to tackling the various cancers and what stage they're at and which ones you think are the most promising? Sure. I would probably divide my answer up into two categories. I would say diagnosis and treatment. So in terms of 
diagnosis, the development of simple blood tests or use of artificial intelligence to detect cancer could be another game changer in the space. Avoids the invasive process of biopsies. And in fact, a lot of cancers, patients present with very general symptoms. So it's hard to pick up the cancer early. So a lot of the cancers, for example, pancreatic cancer, which of course is one of the deadliest cancers, is picked up very late because of the very general symptoms that patients have. So having you know simple tests like blood tests that can pick up cancers early, I think is going to be really important. In the area of treatment, precision oncology is also really, really important in the field of cancer. You know, targeting specific tumor markers such as exon 20, KRAS in lung cancer, FLIP3 in acute leukemia, I think is going to be very important. And then as I think about the various types of treatments, an obvious area, as I mentioned earlier, is immunotherapy. So in the field of antibodies, we've now developed bispecific antibodies. So they don't only attach to a tumor target, but they also attach to the body's immune killer cells, which then allows the immune system to be directed to attack tumor cells. So that's really important. We've also found ways to attach toxins to antibodies, which attack tumor cells in a targeted way, only when the antibody binds to a tumor cell so that you're not getting the side effects of toxins all over the system. We're also seeing advances in cell therapy, where the body's immune system is actually trained to seek out and destroy tumor cells that normally evade the immune system. So the whole field of immunotherapy, I would say, is an important category in the treatment of cancer. The area of oncogenes or oncogenic drivers, we now have developed small molecules that target these key oncogenic drivers or these oncogenes that are mutated genes, which really drive the proliferation and growth of tumor cells. We're now able to drug certain oncogenes that were previously undruggable. Protein degradation is another area that I think a recent area of promising research. So protein degradation is a relative new field of research. In a normal cell, protein degradation is usually used to remove abnormal or unnecessary proteins as part of a general housekeeping function in the body. However, when a cell is unable to remove these proteins, it can result in an accumulation of abnormal proteins, which can then lead to cancer. So protein degraders can address what I would call these previously undruggable intracellular targets. And those protein degraders can then restore the ability of the cell to remove these abnormal proteins. So lots of interesting research going on in both detection of cancer and treatment of cancer. And I would say, since you asked me about which areas I think are the most promising, I do think in the area of cancer detection, early screening, having, you know, things like simple blood tests to pick up cancers early is going to be a major advance in the space. In terms of immunotherapy, driving the potency of antibodies by making things like bispecific antibodies that simultaneously target key cancer targets, as well as the body's own immune cells, I think holds great promise. Efficacy, I, I would say we could see same with antibody drug conjugates, where you combine a toxin to an antibody to selectively target tumor cells. Also, uh, exploiting novel pathways is going to be really important, such as MICA, MICB, which then prevents cancer cells from evading the immune system. So those areas hold a lot of promise because a lot of these cancer cells are very clever. They find ways to hide from the immune system. The development of in vivo cell therapies as opposed to ex vivo cell therapies would allow you know, these important treatments to be available to a much wider patient population. So at Cullin and Oncology specifically, our focus is on modality agnostic precision oncology. So this goes back to our earlier discussion about cancer being a complex group of heterogeneous diseases. Uh, cancer initiation growth are very complex processes, often involving dysregulation or multiple pathways. So that's why we take this unique modality agnostic approach so that we can pursue a diverse pipeline that isn't hinged on a specific modality. So we start by focusing on identifying the target first. So our discovery engine, our scientists discover high impact cancer targets, uh, and they range from engineered therapeutic proteins that monoclonal antibodies, kinase inhibitors, protein degradators. So we start with the target first, and then we think about what's the right modality to address that target rather than the other way around. And so that way we can develop treatments that target both the tumor and the tumor microenvironment.
You mentioned the different kinds of cancer and also the different kinds of approach. Is a combination of approaches, do you think, going to be something that's important as we move forward? Yes, cancer is very, very complex. And we see that when patients become resistant to treatments, for example, as well. So even within a specific tumor type, there are multiple pathways involved. So so yes, combination therapies that exploit multiple pathways all at the same time will likely yield the most effective treatment. So combination treatment approaches, which target different pathways, I do think are going to be very important moving forward. But at the same time, we do need to ensure we're managing toxicities also. So when we're combining treatments, we don't want to cause excessive side effects for patients so that we you know, end up impacting their quality of life in a very negative way. So this is why better targeted treatments, combining them also is going to be really important as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of looking into a crystal ball and you can't guarantee any of this, but what do you think are the timelines for some of these biotech solutions to start making a huge impact? You know, many of the areas that I did mention are either currently being actively developed within the biotech sector, and some of those drugs have already been approved. Without putting a specific date on it, I I do think we are going to see innovative new treatments within the next five years that will really significantly improve outcomes for patients with cancer. I think we're going to see new treatments every year moving forward. And I also think our understanding of both the biologic and genetic basis of cancer continues to improve exponentially. So I do think that we'll continue to bring really exciting new treatments in the biotech sector for cancer patients. At the uh, beginning, you mentioned President Biden's moonshot announcement. Do you think that that will make a difference? You know, I do think that the president's announcement last week will make a difference on several fronts. So, you know, he announced a very clear goal of reducing the death rate of cancer by at least 50% in the next 25 years. So we have a very clear goal in sight. So that's very important. Very importantly also is that there's now going to be funding to go with it as well. So, you know, where there's funding for research, great things happen. He also spoke about many of the areas I covered, like earlier detection and different ways to approach the treatment of cancer. And then finally, I think the way the president described the whole government approach is going to be very important. I spoke about collaboration earlier. And so taking that whole government approach, I think is going to be really important to make sure there aren't these silos sitting in different departments in terms of developing new strategies. And ultimately, it's going to be in the same way that I spoke about different pathways. Ultimately, it's going to be multidisciplinary thinking that's going to significantly reduce the current cancer death rate. Hopefully, ending on a positive note, what's your prognosis for a cancer-free or as close as we can to a cancer-free world as possible? I am excited about the future. For me, the promise of science has never been brighter, especially in the area of cancer research. We know more about the underlying biologic and genetic drivers that cause cancer than we ever have in history. And as we develop better screening methods to detect cancer earlier, as we focus on discovering more targeted treatment approaches, we'll be able to significantly increase the cure rates of patients with cancer over the next few years. So I'm very excited about the opportunities ahead of us. It means we've got a lot of work to do, but that's the stuff we live for. Where are you at timeline-wise with your own company? When I joined the company in October of 2021, we had one program in the clinic. We now have three programs in the clinic across a range of different tumor types. And hopefully by this time next year, Jim, we'll have five programs in the clinic. And so our lead program, Entering Pivotal Studies, by the end of this year, we have two programs currently in phase one studies, and then we'll have two new programs entering phase one next year. So at Cullin and Oncology, we're super excited about the future and the impact that our treatments can bring to patients. As I said, our goal is to develop new standards of care for patients with cancer. Let's hope that there's cause for optimism, and it's great that so many biotech companies are doing so much in this area. Now it's time to head over to JLL and see what Travis McReady has found for us in the news this week. Hi, Travis. Hey, Jim. Good to be with you. As per usual, lots of big news this past week, but one story that stuck with me was Bluebird Bio announcing that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration had granted accelerated approval for its gene therapy treatment for 
childhood cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy, or CALD for short. I'm going to go out on a limb here and date myself for a minute and say listeners unfamiliar with this cruel genetic disease should probably watch the 1991 movie Lorenzo's Oil starring Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon, preferably with a box of tissues nearby. While Hollywood gets some of the science wrong, no surprise, the movie highlights how lethal CALD is for children, principally boys, and the effect the child's rapidly deteriorating condition can have on the family economically and emotionally. In that context, consider the significance of Bluebird's treatment, Skysona. Until last month, only two gene therapies for inherited diseases had been approved by the FDA, with Skysona and Bluebird's August approval of Zinteglo to treat beta thalassemia, that count has doubled. While this provides optimism to many other gene therapy companies with programs advancing to the FDA, Bluebird has been a visible reminder to scientists, investors, and regulators alike just how difficult, cutting edge, and unproven gene therapy remains. With its programs, the company has been beset by manufacturing, efficacy, and regulatory concerns that have brought it to the brink. These approvals this past month represent a glimmer of hope, not only for patients, but for the entire gene therapy modality. Much will and needs to be said about Skysona's price tag. At $3 million, it stands as the most expensive for any drug in the industry. We could talk for hours about this alone because curative gene therapies like Skysona provoke this question of how much we are willing to pay for cures, not just treatments. In any event, the question for Bluebird that other gene therapy companies will closely watch is the degree to which U.S. insurers will reimburse Skysona for Skysona in order to ensure equitable access amongst this small patient population. Lastly, I think of the significance of these approvals in the context of Bluebird as a company. I can remember back in the 20-teens uh, during uh, the height of Kendall Square Cambridge's renaissance when Bluebird's name went up on the side of an entire building. It was a beacon representing the future of precision medicine. The going has been rough for the company since then. Its stock price has dragged the past five years, and not unlike many biopharma peers of late, the company's financial retrenchment has forced layoffs of 30% and a real estate consolidation. Martin Luther King Jr. once reminded us that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, notwithstanding layoffs, technical setbacks, and regulatory change, something similar could also be said about science and health progress. Indeed, according to global data, there are over 400 cell and gene therapies currently under development for a variety of conditions. McKinsey estimates that by 2025, these regenerative medicines could comprise about 20% of total new product launches. To be a bit reductive, in my mind, that's just great news for patients. That's it for me, and uh, I look forward to being with you next week, Jim. Have a great week. Great. Thanks, Travis. We will catch up with you again next week somehow, even though I'll be in Sweden. Travis McReady is the leader of JLL's Life Science Markets Advisory Practice in the Americas, working closely with the global and scaling life sciences companies, developers, and investors to achieve breakthroughs. He has more than 25 years of experience spearheading successful ventures related to technology and innovation, including as president and CEO of a $1.6 billion life sciences funding agency. And that does it for another week. Next week's is going to be a bit of a challenge, what with the trip thrown in, so likely a few late nights on the horizon. Crazily enough, I have 10 interviews already done, and by the end of the day it will be 11, so definitely not a problem filling the next few podcasts. It's great that there's so much happening, that's for sure. I don't know how it happened, but next week's podcast is the last one in September. 
And there's one event in October and two in November, so I'm going to be racking up the air miles. Although having said that, probably not, as you don't get as many points for flying around Europe as you used to. It's like those credit cards where you get one point for every hundred dollars, and for every hundred points you get a dollar off. Just another reminder that this week's podcast was sponsored by Single Use Support, the end-to-end process solution provider for fluid management. Single Use Support innovates solutions around single use technologies, including freeze thaw, fill drain, cold storage, and shipping of products in single use systems. Its Ross shell protects any type and size of single use bags, enabling customers to produce life saving drugs more safely and economically. And so I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast and that wherever in the world you are, you have a great week ahead, and you'll join us again next time for another Beyond Biotech.